Hello everybody. So today we're going to talk about rotational kinetic energy. And let's do a quick review on what normal or standard kinetic energy was all about. Remember that you have a kinetic energy formula. It was it's specifically called translational kinetic energy, and it's given by the formula 1 half mv squared. And this is a very, very common formula. Often you would have to do problems where you would connect this with potential energy, particularly either gravitational, which is just mgh, or spring potential energy, which is just 1 half kx squared. And you often set these two equal to each other and did some problems either solving for velocity or some other uh, variable. And certainly it makes sense for you to use problems like these, especially on a pendulum problem. For example, let's say you have a pendulum and it has some mass here, you know, and it's, it's starting at potential energy, but you're, you want to figure out, you know, What's the potential energy? What's the velocity of this thing right here at the very bottom? You, know, you want to find the velocity here. And you would certainly convert this all into kinetic energy right here as it starts moving. So kinetic energy is the energy that's happening when it's actually moving, when it's sliding down a, an incline, when it's actually moving, when certain, when certain objects are moving. Um, potential is the energy that it has to potentially, you know, whatever potential energy has to move. Um, so let's say you're holding up a ball in your hand. So for example, if you were some person and you had some object on your hand, well, you can hold it for as long as you possibly could maybe, but it has potential energy to fall. There's energy that's potentially going down if you, as soon as you lose grip. And certainly there's a very good set of problems to do with here. And I'm gonna talk about a specific problem. So let's say that you have a hill that's five meters high. You have some ball at the top. And so of course there's potential energy here. And you wanna figure out what the velocity at the very bottom is, right before it hits the bottom you want to know what the final velocity is. And by all means, you would treat this with all the knowledge that you have so far without any rotational uh, knowledge. You would just simply go here and say, okay, well, potential, so energy is conserved. So the initial energy is equal to the final energy. Then you would say, okay, so potential gravitational energy in this problem is equal to the kinetic energy here. So you would then do a series of steps where, okay, so mgh is equal to 1 half mv squared. The masses will cancel out. So gh is equal to 1 half v squared. V is equal to 2gh with a square root. And you would plug in your numbers here, and you notice that mass doesn't matter. So I don't need to give you mass as a um, thing, but the professor or teacher might trick you by giving you mass in this problem. Remember, you don't really need to use it. Might be a trick. And plugging in our numbers here, it's just two times gravity's acceleration, which is 9.8 meters per second, times the height that we were given, which is just five meters. And this is really the square root of 98. And if you do it on your calculator, you would get 9.899 meters per second. And you would label that as your final answer. However, we have a little problem here. In real life, let's say you had a bowling ball and you rolled it down a hill. The ball isn't just staying steady in the sense that, okay, well, it's falling down. But what about the fact that this ball right here, as it's traveling down, it's going to also be rotating like this. There's some rotation going on here as it's sliding down. And at the bottom, it's still rotating a little bit. 
And how do we know that this rotation that the ball is dealing with as it falls down is not making any difference to the velocity? And to really see if that actually points into any sort of new insight, we need to consider a rotational kinetic energy formula. So in this case, now with the understanding that there's a ball that's rotating, and yes, indeed, the answer to the question does it matter is it does matter. The rotation is actually affecting the velocity. And so we're going to introduce you to a new formula. So remember, kinetic energy was equal to 1 half mv squared, but this is specifically called translational kinetic energy. So there's a t at the t subscript at the bottom. Well, now the kinetic energy formula for rotation or rotational kinetic energy is equal to 1 half i omega squared. And the i here is inertia, and the omega here is angular velocity. Now notice that there are very, they, these two formulas are very similar. They both have the 1 half something something squared. 1 half mv squared, 1 half i omega squared. And intuitively, this makes sense because omega is angular velocity. We're not dealing with linear velocity for rotation. We have to be dealing with angular, rotational velocity. And so this is really important. Now, here's a note on inertia. Different object types have different inertias inertia formulas more specifically for the problem that we were doing above and by the way the inertia should be given to you the inertia for whatever object you're dealing with for example your inertia can be a, uh, about a disc a hoop a sphere a solid sphere a hollow sphere whatever in this case we're dealing in this problem i'm going to redraw it for you guys you have some ball here and you want to find the velocity at the end which has some rotational movement remember that this is a solid sphere i just spelled sphere wrong so that's what we're going to assume for this problem that this is a solid sphere it's a just a simple ball and the inertia for a solid sphere is given by i is equal to mr squared. Keep that in mind, we're going to use this conversion here, this formula, to help us solve this problem. Okay, so now let's find the final velocity. Let's do this problem again. So, the setup is still very similar. We have potential energy is equal to kinetic energy translational. But now, we're just going to add rotational kinetic energy. Oh, that's it. You're just going to add it. You're not going to multiply. You're not going to divide. You're not subtracting. You're just adding it. You're adding the rotational kinetic energy. Okay? So this is the setup that you're going to follow for quite literally every problem you're going to get on the physics test. Okay, so let's start plugging in, uh, replacing these with the formulas. So MGH is equal to 1 half mv squared plus 1 half i omega squared. Now at this point, you know how to plug in for these two, but you don't really know what to plug in here. You have, you have no idea the problem. I never gave you what omega and inertia were. And that's for a good reason. You don't need them. And we'll see why in a second. Remember, inertia is given by this formula for a solid sphere. So the first thing we're going to do is plug that in to here. So mgh is equal to 1 half mv squared plus 1 half times, uh, and I'm pretty sure for a solid, oh, slight mistake. Turns out the inertia formula for a solid sphere is 2 fifths mr squared. 2 fifths. So just make that slight note. Of note. So it's going to be 2 fifths m r squared and then we just have an omega squared at the very end 
I'll write that omega. The omega looks more like this. Okay, now what can we do? Well, now we notice that we have a mass term for each term. So that means we can just cancel them out. So once again, mass has no relevance. So gh is equal to one half v squared. And by the way, the fact that mass has no relevance means that no matter how heavy or how light a ball is, it's going to slide the same. So let me just write that v better. So one half v squared plus, and then just simplify this fraction a little bit. The twos will cancel out one fifth. And then we just have r squared omega squared. Okay, well, what do we do from here? Remember that the formula for velo angular velocity involved velocity and radius. We just have a, this relation where velocity linear is equal to the radius times the angular velocity. And think of this in terms of units, right? We have meters times radians, or sorry, radians per second. And radians isn't really a real unit. It's not really a measurement of a distance. It's just kind of a label we have. So this really is just meters per second. Okay, so we this is the formula here. Or you can remember as omega is equal to velocity divided by the radius. Well, in this case, we're going to use that conversion and say this is okay. Well, gh is equal to one half v squared plus one fifth and this in this entire thing is the same as r omega squared right because a to a squared b squared is equal to a b all squared right so this is really just v squared okay well that's awesome so this is really just v squared so we're going to put that right here and now we can do some simplifying. So GH, we can combine these two terms here into a single term. Um, this will actually just be 7 tenths V squared. Multiply both sides by 10 over 7. So V squared is equal to 10 GH over 7. Solve for V. This is just the square root of 10 GH over 7. Now we're going to plug in our numbers here. Remember that G is 9.8 and H we were given as 5. So V is equal to the square root of 10 times 9.8 times 5 all divided by 7. And plug that into your calculator. So I'm going to do that. And you should get 8.366. Let's just stop there. Six 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 seven. Oops. Meters per second as our final answer. Okay, so hopefully you understand each step that we took here and compare that before we had nine point eight nine nine meters per second without taking into account rotation. But now we have a smaller velocity. We have 8.367. And this intuitively makes sense because, in fact, the roll, it's kind of going against the hill. I mean, it's rolling this way. It's rolling in the clockwise direction. And when it's rolling clockwise, when it's going down to the right, it's kind of rotating against the velocity. It's trying to climb back up. And so you're, ha you're actually having some resistance with the velocity. And so even if we added the kinetic energy, we see that it actually doesn't make it bigger. So you can't really always tell. So this is a classic example of what kinetic energy looks like. And this is everything you're pretty much going to need to understand about rotational kinetic energy. Different problems will have different natures, but ultimately you're going to set the same stuff. You're going to have some energy conservation, most likely. And there you have it, guys. So this is all you're going to, um, you know, this is a good review for you guys. Hopefully this helped you out a little bit for understanding how to do kinetic energy rotational, kinetic energy, sorry, problems. And have a good rest of your day.